Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Meridian's uh, conversation on COVID-19 and the global wow. challenges we face. Um, we are very pleased that you all are joining us today for a discussion with uh, Ambassador John Lang, who has a very deep range of experiences um, with this issue, currently serving as a senior fellow at the UN Foundation he also served as the uh, special envoy for avian and pandemic diseases under President Barack Obama and has an extensive array of experience uh, as a diplomat and uh, serving as our U.S. ambassador in Botswana. We'll have a conversation with Ambassador Lang, and we will also be hearing from some of our key stakeholders uh, at Meridian International. Uh, we have Ambassador Ashok Mapuri uh, joining us. We have uh, 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 Brittany Masalosalo uh, from 3M. Uh, thank you for their support today. And we have Ambassador Nestor Forster of Brazil also joining us later in the program. So uh, to remind everyone, Meridian's role in uh, both Washington as well as around the world is to try to bring together different perspectives from the public, private, and the diplomatic sector to try to look at uh, developing better solutions to the challenges we face in the world. And obviously, this is a very, very significant challenge. Uh, it's one that many anticipated, uh, but still, I think there is a sense that the United States may not have been uh, as ready as it should have been for this. Um, I think Ambassador Lang, because of his extensive experience uh, on this issue, may start us off with a little bit of historical perspective and context, given his work on some of the other issues like SARS, H1N1, and Ebola. So, John, welcome uh, to Meridian, and uh, we'd like to turn it over to you for a few remarks, and then we'll take some questions. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Ambassador Holiday, and uh, thanks also to uh, Frank Justice and Meridian for focusing today on the, the global perspectives on uh, this novel coronavirus. Um, uh, the situation as of this morning, according to Johns Hopkins University, is that over 435,000 uh, cases of infection have been confirmed and almost 20,000 deaths. Uh, in, uh, and this has affected at least 189 countries and territories. So we really are dealing with a global pandemic. But to discuss this, I think it would be useful, as you said, to put this into historical context, just looking back uh, to 2003 and, and subsequent years. Uh, following the 2003 outbreak of SARS, the severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, when China failed to report the infectious disease outbreak in a timely fashion, uh, the World Health Organization uh, member states decided that uh, they needed to update what is called the International Health Regulations, IHR. And those were uh, approved by the World Health Assembly in 2005. They came into force in uh, 2007. It's binding international law and 196 governments have uh, signed up uh, for it, uh, including the United States. And the international health regulations are really the bedrock of global health security. Countries agreed to build their capacities to detect, assess, and report public health events, all coordinated by the World Health Organization. Uh, then in uh, 2006, my own work on pandemic preparedness and response began. I was a senior foreign service officer and uh, Paula Dobriansky, who's now on your diplomatic engagement advisory committee, uh, uh, and then was the Under Secretary of State, asked me to lead a new office in the State Department. And then we were focused on the threat from bird flu, H5N1. Uh, President George Bush had focused uh, on it because he had read John Barry's book, The Great Influenza, about the deadly 1918-1919 pandemic. And he was very concerned that we could go, uh, go through another catastrophic uh, pandemic if that uh, uh, H5N1 virus mutated to form human-to-human -human transmission. He led an effort uh, uh, called the International Partnership on Avian and Pandemic Influenza. Uh, and it was a major uh, uh, effort to try to coordinate among countries working with the UN system influenza coordinator, the WHO director general and others. And 
I, I think there may be some um, MDs and or people with master's degrees in public health uh, in the audience uh, you know, here at the Meridian today. But on the whole, that you have diplomats and business executives and others, and the, the whole approach that the Bush administration took on this was that this needed a whole of government approach and a whole of society approach. It's pandemics when they really are severe are not just a matter for health ministries. They involve ministries of foreign affairs for international cooperation, ministries of finance because of the uh, economic implications, uh, 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 ministries of the interior, uh, homeland security, etc. It really involves everyone. Um, the problem in a sense was when a pandemic did come, it wasn't the severe one that we had thought would come from uh, bird flu, H5N1. It was a moderate one that, uh, from swine flu, uh, H1N1. And after the world uh, was able to respond to the swine flu pandemic of 2009, 2010, governments tended to lose interest. The, the funding went away from many parliaments and congresses. After that, there were uh, concerns. You had the um, uh, Ebola crisis in West Africa, which was uh, uh, terrible in, in the three most affected countries of West Africa, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. Uh, and over, over 11,000 people died, but it wasn't the kind of uh, a global pandemic that we were concerned about. Uh, President Obama, uh, created the, what is called the global health security agenda. And this is something I hope that the business people in the, the audience will uh, uh, be interested in, uh, as well as the governments, because uh, it had, uh, that was created in 2014, but it continues today. And there's a private sector roundtable of, of uh, uh, companies that are interested uh, and supportive of efforts to improve global health security. And that effort, the global health security agenda, uh, was a broader effort. It wasn't just pandemic preparedness, but includes biosafety and biosecurity, antimicrobial resistance, immunization, disease surveillance, laboratory systems, uh, workforce development, and zoonotic diseases. Uh, we had the, the Zika uh, crisis in, uh, that began in Brazil and, and affected uh, uh, the Americas in 2015. There's uh, uh, the uh, Ebola outbreak that is just ending now in the eastern uh, uh, part of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, in some, we've had a lot of warning signals over 20 years that we needed to be prepared for pandemics and we needed to improve our efforts to prepare. Uh, let me uh, 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 cite one quotation. An internal report prepared by the World Bank estimates that a severe influenza pandemic could kill 71 million people and cause a recession costing more than $3 trillion. The report says that in a severe pandemic, sagging tourism, transportation, retail sales, and productivity, coupled with worker absenteeism, could reduce global gross domestic product by 4.8%. It sounds like the World Bank could have written that today. They wrote it in October, 2008. These warning signals have been there. And to me, one of the saddest parts of it is how unprepared or underprepared governments and international institutions are for what we're experiencing today because we knew it was coming. We didn't know when, we didn't know how severe it, was, it would be, but we knew some type of pandemic would come. And the coronavirus is not a pandemic influenza, which is what I had worked on, on under President Bush, but it is a, a, a very similar uh, uh, set of concerns in terms of how this pandemic is progressing. Uh, in terms of the current situation uh, uh, the, the, with this uh, novel coronavirus called COVID-19, uh, China first informed the World Health Organization under these international health regulations in, on December 31st, 2019, and on January 30th, the Director General of WHO, uh, Dr. Tedros, declared this to be a public health emergency of international concern. At that time, he said, the main reason for this declaration is not because of what is happening in China, but because of what is happening in other countries. Our greatest concern is the potential for the virus to spread to countries with weaker health systems and which are ill-prepared to deal with it. The only way we will defeat this outbreak is for all countries to work together in a spirit of solidarity and cooperation, 
We are all in this together and we can only stop it together. And in fact, in today's Washington Post, there's an op-ed article by Director General Tedros and Undersecretary General Mark Wolcock from the United Nations giving that same message that we are all in this together and we can't be in a situation where the poorest countries of the world with the weakest health systems suffer so greatly and, and, and go through chaos because of the way this uh, uh, pandemic is spreading. There is a solidarity fund uh, that has been created. It's called the uh, COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. Uh, the U UN Foundation, where I'm currently uh, based, is uh, uh, hosting that on behalf of uh, WHO to raise money for uh, WHO's work in this regard. And solidarity is an important aspect, I think, for all governments, uh, business executives, and others to really keep in mind as this progresses. Uh, let me just mention a few, how a few countries have responded to this uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, a lot of people think that Singapore has had the best response. It's had massive testing, contract, contact tracing, and isolation of cases. A very important aspect of there is the trust in the government, and that doesn't uh, apply to all governments of the world. Um, Brazil, as of yesterday, had uh, uh, almost 2,000 confirmed cases and 34 deaths. India, as I'm sure many of you have heard, a country of 1.3 billion people has declared a 21-day lockdown. Uh, I'm sure most people hadn't heard the term social distancing until recently, but that's the fundamental way uh, to keep this virus from spreading, is that not to be in a direct contact with those who have it. Uh, looking to other regions of the world, Iran it has the fourth highest death toll uh, in, in the world, with almost 2,000 people dead. Uh, after uh, Italy, China, and Spain. In Africa, coronavirus cases uh, were slow to arrive. Uh, a lot of times they were coming in from uh, people who had flown in from Europe, but if the virus is spreading quickly there. Uh, it's now uh, reached more than 1,700 people across 45 countries. South Africa's president on Monday said he was develop, uh, deploying the military onto the streets to help police enforce a three-week nationwide lockdown. You can look at Senegal and Ivory Coast in West Africa. Each has declared a state of emergency. Senegal is imposing a dusk to dawn curfew. The Ivory Coast has said it will uh, introduce gradual confinement measures. And the private sector, of course, is getting engaged uh, and has been so ad adversely affected in so many ways uh, by the uh, uh, sudden drop in uh, commerce, and uh, travel, et cetera. Uh, I'd be curious when we get to the question and answer uh, a section, session uh, if, uh, from the experience of some of your uh, uh, business partners at Meridian, because uh, one of the ways in which one prepares for a possible pandemic is to go through scenarios and simulations. Uh, and there have been these simulations uh, just in the last six months, some of these have gone on, uh, both in the United States and um, at the Munich Security Conference and elsewhere. Uh, but they really weren't as pervasive as they should have been. They, they involved some people who were already engaged in global health security issues. And McKinsey did a recent report uh, in which they said that exponential case count growth is hard to internalize unless you've experienced it before. And they, they claim, and I'm curious as to what others believe on this, managers who have not experienced this or been through a tabletop simulation are finding it difficult to respond correctly. In particular, escalation mechanisms may be misunderstood in theory, but companies are finding them hard to execute in reality as the facts on the ground don't always conform to uh, what they read in a manual. Uh, I, to me, one of the most important aspects of this, when I look at the history of uh, pandemic preparedness over the last uh, 20 years, is we have to not just look at the short-term immediate needs, which are immense, but we also have to look at the long term. Uh, when uh, Congresses and parliaments are uh, appropriating funds for this, they shouldn't appropriate the funds in such a limited way that it can only be used for the novel coronavirus and not used, for example, for pandemic influenza. And there's a section of uh, US, uh, uh, the U of US appropriation of $8.5 billion that uh, uh, came about um, two weeks ago which limits it to coronavirus and does not apply to, uh, to a pandemic influenza, which could also occur at any time. Uh, we really do need to look at 
the long term and build it into regular appropriations, not just supplemental appropriations, which run out and then have to, and, and when there's no emergency on the horizon, as I uh, said, uh, it's often the case that the, uh, the uh, governments just don't, don't want to fund things because they don't think it's important. When the World Bank uh, announced on March 14th, or sorry, March 17th, an increase in its uh, package uh, of assistance to $14 billion to assist companies and countries in their efforts to prevent, detect, and respond to COVID-19, it included in their efforts to strengthen national systems for public health preparedness. Uh, and that's fundamental to, to uh, in, uh, fundamental need, not just in the rich countries in the world, but even more importantly, in the, the low income countries in the world. Um, and another aspect of this is several global health security experts have uh, proposed that the G7 and G20 immediately establish a global health security challenge fund. And this challenge fund would be resourced at a, at initially at least a billion dollars. Uh, uh, funding would be prioritized for the countries in greatest need. Uh, and uh, it would uh, do uh, much to encourage domestic investment um, in uh, preparedness for possible pandemics. Uh, so my fundamental hope, uh, and I look forward to further discussion of this in our uh, uh, event today, is that we use this terrible crisis as an opportunity to not only to deal with the short-term immediate huge needs, but also to build long-term health security capacity. Uh, as, as someone said, after this is over, let's not disband, let's prepare for the next one. Well, John, thank you very much for that uh, overview. Um, I wanted to, again, it's Stuart Holiday here, CEO of Meridian. Uh, I wanted to uh, encourage people if they have questions to go and uh, use the Q&A function on Zoom uh, if you want to weigh in. But I wanted to start by giving you a kind of a, a question about what you called the, the global readiness for these kinds of pandemics. It seems that um, there's a multilateral level, you know, through the World Health Organization that is uh, sort of uh, looking at this issue on an ongoing basis, but national governments haven't really developed a consistent way of linking up and sharing information as they would, for example, after uh, the terrorist attacks of, of September the 11th, where nations came together and decided to set up, uh, you know, uh, information sharing mechanisms, the, the counterterrorism center. There are a variety of institutions that were set up that allowed national governments to connect on an ongoing basis on something that is a threat really to uh, global security. What's missing from the current uh, international mechanisms that you think would be helpful in uh, you know, of dealing with this crisis, but also putting into place something that could be useful in the future? We are now in the middle of this, uh, and it's pretty hard to create any kind of new institution. Uh, so uh, I, I guess my first tenant's inclination would be to use existing uh, mechanisms and institutions. Um, there has been a fair amount of uh, information sharing in, uh, through various mechanisms, including one called GSAID, G-I-S-A-I-D. Uh, that's uh, something where uh, that's really for the scientists, but it's... Uh, 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 dealing with uh, virus sequences and sharing of information and data that then is used by uh, 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 governments and by the World Health Organization uh, to provide for real-time uh, uh, progress in understanding this uh, COVID-19. Uh, you have the mechanisms of, of that already exist, such as uh, uh, the World Health Organization and its 194 member states. You have the G7 and the G20, and the G20 has, uh, is going to, my understanding, is going to convene an emergency summit virtually. Um, the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Guterres, has uh, uh, sent a letter urging them to create a response mechanism guided by the World Health Organization, but to have, a, a, uh, have the G20, uh, the world's uh, the 20 uh, leading uh, 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 nations uh, and economies, to come up with this uh, uh, a response mechanism uh, and uh, to tr have a more coordinated effort to uh, 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 distribute 
medical uh, and protective equipment, which is so uh, mm -hmm. uh, desperately needed. Uh, and also to, to have greater coordination on large scale st stimulus packages. Uh, those are the suggestions from the Secretary General. Uh, so there are uh, mechanisms in place on this. Uh, and uh, we do need to have a better uh, uh, coordinated effort on this. One other thing I, I should mention, today the UN Secretary General is going to announce uh, a, a new fund called the COVID-19 Global Humanitarian Response Plan. And this is really uh, pushed by uh, uh, Norway to assist developing countries with weak health systems to address COVID-19's long-term uh, consequences. So there are a lot of efforts out there, uh, and uh, I think uh, we need to uh, uh, look at those and support those. Great. How about on the U.S. government level, when you, you know, see the press conferences, uh, there's a range of government officials standing up there, some that you haven't heard of before that are brought in on an ad hoc basis. But institutionally, what agency or point of government should be in the lead on something like this as it relates both to the international aspect and then potentially the, the domestic response? Uh, the Trump administration created its uh, uh, national biodefense strategy, uh, 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 I believe it was two years ago, uh, and they, that is actually uh, uh, quite clear that the Department of Health and Human Services has the lead on biosafety, biosecurity, uh, uh, bio threats. Uh, and you see that through Secretary Azar, through uh, others who are part of HHS, including Dr. Tony Fauci at the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Robert Redfield at CDC uh, in Atlanta. And uh, they're very, clearly this is a health issue above all. But my earlier point of, of, of President Bush's approach to this was uh, to specifically assign the State Department to coordinate the international engagement on pandemic preparedness. Uh, and uh, there, there, and I, clearly the, the State Department has been uh, engaged on this, Secretary Pompeo and others. Uh, the, the White House uh, uh, has the coordinating function in the National Security Council. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, I'm not party, of course, since I'm no longer in the US government to those task force meetings, but they're clearly uh, daily, uh, have a, a lot of highly trained people in there. I, I was the first uh, deputy global AIDS coordinator, one of the two, when uh, PEPFAR began, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and the current head of it, the US Global AIDS Coordinator, Doc, uh, Ambassador Deborah Burks, uh, uh, is uh, top notch, and, and uh, you've been able to see her in uh, the press conferences. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, deep expertise in the US government. Uh, that are advising uh, the president uh, and the vice president on uh, ways to proceed. John, we have uh, a question that looks like it could be an entire year-long course. Uh, so a broad question, but it's from Ben Robinson, and it's, uh, what do you believe will be the systematic changes to business and society due to the pandemic? And I guess I might try to distill that down in that there's a lot of discussion about a return to normalcy at some point in the next several weeks or months. Um, it, do you see fundamental and permanent changes into the way we're going to do business and how we interact and relate to each other as a society as a result of this particular uh, pandemic? Uh, well, uh, I believe uh, that Frank Justice told me this is your first ever webinar. Uh, uh, since you normally uh, have meetings in person at Meridian. Uh, sure. I, I, think, uh, I think people will find that webinars uh, work pretty well and uh, maybe we don't have to uh, fly people to meetings all over the world uh, uh, to, to meet in person. Uh, there, there, there may be many ways in which society changes as a result of this. But in terms of the institutions, uh, I, uh, there had already been a, a fair number of experts in global health security who had thought that the international health regulations needed to be uh, uh, revamped uh, based on the experience that we've had since they were adopted in 2005. Uh, I think there will, uh, uh, the people, uh, the, the uh, member states of WHO will certainly want to take a look at that. Uh, uh, there will be a lot of um, other uh, efforts to uh, have on hand the personal protective equipment that is needed uh, in the in a situation such as this, uh, the face masks, uh, uh, etc., the, the the ventilators that are going to be needed. But uh, 
I, one of my fears is that, uh, as you often find, uh, uh, the accusation of people in the military is they're always fighting the last war. And that's one of the fears I would have from this is, oh, well, now we know we need more ventilators, uh, as opposed to an all hazards approach uh, and creating stockpiles um, uh, that would be available uh, to, uh, for example, in this case, WHO to deliver from rather than creating huge numbers of ventilators and uh, personal protective equipment in every country in the world. Uh, I, 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 I still remember when I was working with Paula Dobryansky uh, uh, and we were very concerned about the uh, potential of a pandemic. Uh, we had, a, there were big international conferences in uh, uh, Vienna, Austria, Bamako, Mali, uh, New Delhi, India, and then in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. And I, I remember going to these conferences and talking to uh, ministers in developing countries, knowing that in their mind, their priority was de dealing with all of the difficulties they had from people who were dying of HIV AIDS or tuberculosis or malaria or measles. And I would then tell them, well, but you need to prepare for a pandemic. We don't know when it will occur, could be decades from now. We don't know how severe it will be, but prepare for it. And it was very hard for them to prioritize that. Uh, and in fact, a, a World Bank official at one point told me that when a country's per capita income is under $5,000, they, they really tend not to want to put money into this, this kind of global health security preparedness measures. So in the institutions that, would be, uh, that will be looking at this in the years to come, we have to keep in mind that that the, the, the weakest health systems are the ones who can least afford the kinds of preparedness measures that need to be taken. And that argues for broader efforts such as this Global Health Security Challenge Fund that has been suggested for the D7 and G20. So John, I've got a couple of questions from the audience. We have about 95 participants. Uh, this is a question from Radio Free Asia from Rita Chang. Um, it, it appears that uh, China is, uh, has gone from being seen as uh, solely the source of this pandemic in Wuhan to uh, trying to position themselves as a leader uh, using public diplomacy efforts to show that their you know, response was, uh, was timely and effective. Um, are they, uh, versus the United States, which has traditionally been a, a, the leader or a leader in responding to uh, global pandemics like this, is this a pivot point for global leadership and health in terms of uh, China versus the United States? Uh, I think it's way too early to tell on that. Um, the, uh, the, if, if we had had this meeting in the uh, middle of January, the, the media uh, were uh, full of criticism of China for its slow response uh, 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 and not being as forthcoming with information as it needed to be. But uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, uh, who's uh, uh, in a, a, a tricky political position as the uh, Director General of the World Health Organization, has praised China's uh, response. Uh, and obviously, uh, he, uh, it was in his interest to, in WHO's interest for him to do that, to keep China being as cooperative as it was. Now China's providing, uh, vent, uh, offering ventilators to Chile and, uh, and doing a lot of uh, uh, efforts to uh, uh, be, be a good partner on this. And, uh, and, but, but, I, but the United States is also including uh, work through the U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, and uh, hey, John, and so, do, do you feel that the that China shared uh, accurately the information early on with the World Health Organization and others um, about the severity of this issue? And it was a question of where uh, we didn't know the level, uh, or was there a degree? Was there an effort, perhaps, to play down the uh, the numbers of the impact in, within China? All I know from that is what I read in, uh, in the media. Uh, and early on, there were some concerns, especially uh, from that one doctor who, uh, who uh, in China who had uh, uh, tried to uh, act, uh, highlight the, 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 uh, how terrible this was. He was uh, criticized by the government for that and then ended up dying and became a hero in China. But uh, uh, you know as well as I do from the media on that, I don't have any inside sources on, yeah. on that. How the Chinese have responded, but I, I again, uh, Dr. Tedros has, has been 
praising how they have responded and, and, uh, and they did follow the rules of the, of the international health regulations to report to WHO uh, mm -hmm. what was happening on December 31st. And, and there are reports that our intelligence community uh, as well was um, raising the flag on the, on the degree to which we should be concerned about this. Uh, I have a question from Megan Beyer, one of our trustees. Um, this is, uh, you know, based upon your experience, um, how can private corporations support the government's response to address this crisis? Uh, there, uh, in the end, uh, the, the efforts that are uh, needed uh, besides the social distancing, which is uh, obviously adversely affecting uh, the, the private sector uh, uh, because of the uh, shutting down of uh, bars and restaurants and uh, many other facilities. Uh, what is needed is equipment and, and, and there's a discussion of the, uh, some of the US auto manufacturers producing ventilators, um, the personal protective equipment. Uh, the, 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 if you look at what happened in Northern Italy in terms of um, the, when, when the deaths started occurring and in the, in the, there's just overwhelming the hospitals and even overwhelming the funeral homes. Um, there, there are so many areas in which the private sector uh, 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 can be uh, uh, instrumental in really uh, uh, alleviating suffering and minimizing the number of deaths. Uh, but uh, this is still playing out in, in very difficult ways. Uh, the United States has its uh, Defense Production Act, but uh, the, as you know from the media, this has been uh, not, not yet been uh, employed by the president uh, in terms of actually insisting that companies uh, react to this. But to me, the private sector is uh, just critical to this response in, in part because of the, the way one deals with this health issue is through all of that, the equipment mm -hmm. supplies that are needed that are produced by the private sector. So I know no one has a crystal ball on where this is all going, but I wanted to ask you um, maybe a, a sort of a final question um, on where you think this is heading. And I know that you've uh, been citing McKinsey and their report just in terms of the range of possibilities um, and maybe drawing upon your, your experience with uh, the previous, uh, you know, pandemics. Yeah, it, um, I uh, I have to say, as one who's really studied pandemics since I uh, first started working on this in uh, 2006, it is very hard to predict. Uh, uh, there, there are so many uncertainties out there. Uh, uh, we don't know if this will be seasonal, and uh, and if when we get to the summer months in the northern hemisphere, uh, the, the uh, transmission will be much less. Uh, and then, of course, in the southern hemisphere, transmission would be higher, but it may not be seasonal. Uh, this is, uh, as they say, a novel uh, a new coronavirus that we haven't experienced in the past. So it's very hard to predict. Uh, McKinsey did a report that I thought was quite interesting, uh, and, and they gave two scenarios, and obviously there are other scenarios that could apply. One is called delayed recovery, in which new case counts in the Americas and uh, Europe rise until mid-April. Uh, then uh, Asian countries uh, actually have peaked earlier. Uh, epidemics in Africa and Oceania are limited. Uh, and there they thought it maybe would take until the fourth quarter of this year for European and US economies to see a genuine recovery. That's the delayed recovery scenario. The prolonged contraction scenario is scarier. In this scenario, the, ep ep the pandemic does not peak in the Americas and Europe until May. Uh, because of delayed testing and weak adoption of social distancing. Um, the virus does not prove to be seasonal, uh, so that you have cases throughout the year. In Africa, Oceania, and uh, some Asian countries also experience a widespread pandemic. And then, in that case, they predicted that the recovery only begins in uh, the second quarter of next year. Uh, now, there uh, the, the one thing that uh, we studied a lot uh, uh, back when we were concerned about the pandemic influenza threat, and again, this is uh, a coronavirus, not an influenza, was the idea that this will come in waves, that it first comes in one wave, and then could be six uh, months later, it will come again. But by then, hopefully, we have in place uh, uh, 
uh, maybe some therapeutics, antivirals or others, other uh, ways to uh, uh, alleviate suffering. Someday there will be a vaccine, although that could take 12 to 18 months. And all of the equipment that we uh, need uh, to care for people, the ventilators and the personal protective equipment to protect the work, health workforce, et cetera. So uh, even if there is a wave, um, mm -hmm. hopefully the second wave uh, we, we will be able to handle better. But I do have to say for the, uh, the catastrophic 1918-1919 uh, pandemic, often called the Spanish flu, uh, that uh, the second wave was worse than the first in terms of uh, deaths. Great. Well, John, you mentioned uh, Singapore uh, in their response and how that's been effective. Obviously, there's a high degree of, of trust there between uh, the government uh, and the people. And uh, there's obviously a pretty, pretty advanced healthcare system. I wanted to bring in our, uh, our good friend, Ashok Mapuri, uh, as well. Ashok has been an ambassador of Singapore to the United States for a number of years. How, how many years, Ashok? Eight years to it. Eight years. So he's closing in on being the dean of the, the, <laughs> the diplomatic corps, which we, which we would fully support. Um, Ashok, I wanted to ask you perhaps, um, first of all, if there's anything that you want to comment on that John said, but, but also to share with us what Singapore has done uh, in response to this pandemic and any tips or advice in terms of approaches that you think, I know your job is not to tell the United States what to do, but we are friends and allies and, and, and just anything we should be aware of that would be useful. Well, first, thank you, Stuart, for inviting me to join this group. And I was really impressed by the comments made by Ambassador John Lang, uh, the sort of overview that he provided. I think that's very useful to understand what we're going to do. You know, I've spent eight years over here a lot of it, the diplomat's job is really meeting face to face. I hope that uh, Ambassador Lang is wrong in his prediction that I'm going to spend the rest of my time here just in webinars and on Zoom yeah. conferences with all of you. I hope to be able to get back in real life with everyone well, as we, soon as we, 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 we too at Meridian are in, uh, in the face to face uh, diplomacy business, but maybe we can strengthen that and augment that with technology. Which I think we have to, because I think the reality is, and Ambassador Lang pointed to this, of this uncertainty of how long this is going to last. Now, Singapore actually identified, we were one of the first few countries to report cases in January, and we quickly started all the measures to identify people, to uh, start contact tracing, to keep our curve relatively flat, and that was in January. But what we've seen in the last week, and the latest numbers really bring us into almost over 600 uh, cases of uh, coronavirus in Singapore, is that the number of cases have doubled in the last week. And much of that doubling is people coming back to Singapore as countries have started to put in place travel advisories, advising people to come back, and they are coming back from around the world. So where we had our initial steps really focused on the Singapore community in Singapore, putting in place some travel restrictions. Now as people from around the world start coming back, we're starting to see a second spike of infections mm -hmm. coming in. The, the, the large challenge in Singapore was really to quickly identify who has the coronavirus. So we invested in surveillance and to leave no stone unturned. To detect every case early, to have thorough contact tracing. And we also put together technology, a mobile app called Trace Together, which is a, uses a short distance Bluetooth signals between mobile phones to log records of people that you may have come into contact with. Now this software is open source and people will be able to use it. We want, we encourage whether it's a company, whether it's others thinking of how can I sort of make sure that if I have the coronavirus or am I in contact with someone, we're trying to put as much of this technology online. Mm -hmm. Now the challenge is really dealing with the imported cases coming in and we've stopped all short-term visitors. People who do arrive in Singapore, even Singaporeans and permanent residents are served a 14 day stay at home notice. This is a mandatory notice where you, wherever you come from, that you have to stay in a place and not leave the place. In many ways, I think the sort of quarantine arrangements that uh, Dr. Deborah Burks and Anthony Fauci have been speaking about, someone who leaves New York should really put themselves on a 14 day sort of uh, quarantine. We've advised all Singaporeans to avoid non-essential travel. And these are fairly drastic measures. We've also started social distancing. We started some social distancing early in January and February. 
but we find that now we actually have to tighten this even more as our cases start to increase. So there are guidelines, again, like the US, that say that the groups should be limited to less than 10 people. Bars, cinemas, entertainment places are closed down. Religious services are suspended. Malls, museum, and tourist attractions are open but are required to reduce crowd density. And we're really starting this whole idea of social distancing. How do you keep people moving and active but maintaining social distancing? I was just saw an image of, we had a parliamentary session in Singapore today where several of the ministers made ministerial statements about the COVID-19 and members of the parliament keeping a so, uh, social distance from themselves. We've kept schools open, but schools are kept even there, keeping the, the appropriate social uh, distancing, no extracurricular activities, no mass distancing, staggered times for recess, classrooms having more space, because you need to keep some aspect of people moving around. Mm -hmm. The medical measures are important. We were fortunate that partly as experience of SARS that we had 15 years ago, we have ex uh, invested considerably in our infectious disease research and survey. In fact, just last year, a new national center for infectious diseases were opened. And so with the world-class system, but even we need to make sure like all healthcare systems that you're not overwhelmed with the crisis. I think that is the bigger challenge. Most of our healthcare systems do not have significant redundancy. We've gone into a very efficient, just-in-time world. And when you come up to a sudden spike, you, you want to avoid that. But the challenge in Singapore, and I suspect in most communities, is you want to avoid the, the spikes but you also want to avoid the prolonged tail because how long will this crisis last? How long do you keep people at home? How long can you impact the economy? And what do you do as you manage with this? How do you deal with just the, the public uh, knowledge about these things? And I wanted to just final, finally speak about Ambassador Lang's point about trust in the government. We are fortunate in Singapore that there is a very active means of communications between the government and the people. We have set up WhatsApp groups. Every day I get WhatsApp from a government website that gives me the latest information to try to avoid the kind of misinformation that is over there. Our government websites have information about debunking false news. There's always false news that someone had coronavirus at this place or someone died from coronavirus over there. You can go there and check. And it's important that governments are very transparent in this. And this was, again, one of the early things that we learned in January was by being an open and transparent every day, there are updated uh, information coming out where the cases are, the total number of cases, including contact tracing of these cases. The idea is really to stay ahead of the curve in many ways. Mm -hmm. Let me just speak briefly on one of the questions that came up, uh, Stuart, if you don't mind, on what comes next. Uh, because how do we keep business open? And that's really the key uh, as we really anticipate an extended crisis. Supply chains are important. In fact, just today, the ministers of Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Myanmar, New Zealand, and Singapore issued a statement reaffirming their commitment to supply chain connectivity during the COVID-19 situation. That's quite important that we make sure that there are no unnecessary tariff barriers coming in, that we are able to move supplies around. The other thing that we really have to start to address is how do you deal with travel advisories as the world shuts down? Are you, can we think of ways in which we can adjust some of these travel advisories according to where places are opening up? What sort of guidelines do we use for these travel advisories? Everyone put the barriers up. The question is when do you put the barriers down? Because there is no off on switch for COVID-19. Yeah. We're not going to go off. How do we then now avoid sort of some of the economic uh, impact while still dealing with the fact that this is going to go on for an extended period. Thank you for letting me speak about these. Thank points. you, Ashok. Um, I just wanted to ask you uh, a question. You know, you mentioned the economic impact. Singapore has developed a, a role as a crossroads and an economic uh, really powerhouse based upon its, its trading relationships, its innovation, its private sector. Um, I know we're all anxious to have the private sector back uh, fully operating, um, and maybe there's a middle ground, as you say, but what has been the impact to Singapore economically of this particular uh, pandemic? You know, the numbers are not yet in for the first quarter, but we expect a very significant downturn. Obviously, the first industries to be hit, as it is in the U.S., is tourism. 
uh, airlines, hotels, the whole tourist industry, food and beverage, entertainment, all of these have been hit. But then you're starting to see other parts of the economy also starting to slow down and shut down. The government, the Singapore government has put in place a uh, first phase of a stimulus uh, package. They are looking at a second stimulus package probably to be announced tomorrow by the finance minister. And as needs be, you want to keep people still having jobs, but you may have to make adjustments along the way. I think that there are no optimistic economic forecasts for the first half of the year. This is reflected mm -hmm. in the stock markets, but it's also reflected in the fact that the movement of goods, services, people is slowing down. Yeah. And, you, you know, you mentioned the, uh, the, the return to uh, getting sort of travel business um, back up in some form or fashion. You know, you've heard a lot in the news in the United States about, well, we'll we're going to open on, you know, the day after Easter. Um, and I, I think there's a sense, there is a sense in the American uh, public that there is a cost that may outweigh, you know, there's a, there's a threshold of, of where the economic damage is relative to the response. But do you think that, uh, that there will be a way for countries to p basically normalize these kinds of standards and these approaches? Because it's very difficult if you have all, you know, member states of the United Nations having different policies, different approaches to this particular question. Obviously, sovereignty is key. You have to have your national policies, but uh, you know, you're only as uh, fast as the slowest person in the boat, as they say. But how do you see that playing out? Well, you know, Stuart, Singapore is a city state. So it's a lot easier for us to put measures that can apply for the whole country, whether it's social distancing, the way we reopen our schools, the way that uh, people conduct business, uh, restaurants really separating guests by having a, a two table distance between guests. You can do that in a place like Singapore. In a place like the United States, you have a much more, your federal state system is quite different. So I see different states, different cities putting in place different measures. The president in some ways hampered by the fact that he has a federal system. He can only offer the guidelines that he did about a week ago. States may react differently. And as you start reopening in the US, would you still want to meet someone who's just flown in from New York? Or are you going to say to anyone who comes from New York, who comes to, to Florida, must have a 14-day uh, quarantine, as the governor of Florida has said? So it's, it's difficult to anticipate how these things will work out, even within countries, particularly continental-sized countries like the US. In the EU, we have seen the, the sort of the idea of the EU coming together as a large group of freedom of movement of people. Countries in the EU have also started to put in place barriers. I think the first thing really is to avoid the sort of economic measures, the closing down of supply chains, because if you don't get the supply chains, manufacturing cannot move ahead. And you need to keep that moving first before I think people may be a little bit slower and longer because of the contagious nature of the epidemic. Singapore, two months into this crisis, still cannot say that we're in a better place because the numbers just keep increasing as people are returning home, even as we shut the borders down for people from outside coming in. Well, our, our thoughts uh, are with the people of Singapore, as I know yours are with us. Best to Gori, thank you for your time uh, today, Ambassador, and uh, we appreciate it very much. You mentioned supply chains. I, I think it's appropriate now for us to turn it over to uh, Brittany Masolosalo from 3M. Uh, 3M has been, uh, of course, uh, at the center of the response to this. 3M is a member of our corporate council. Uh, Meridian's corporate council is a network of leading global companies that uh, engages with each other, with the government and the private sector to try to, again, look at how we can accelerate cooperation. So I'd like to turn it over to Brittany from your perspective. You lead uh, international affairs at 3M. You're, you've obviously been terribly busy uh, and uh, at the center of this. So. Uh, we thank you for your support of Meridian and also want to hear from you about how you're responding uh, to this and how you're doing personally as well. Yes, th thank you, Stuart. Very, very different, but nonetheless grateful for the opportunity. Um, it has been very busy for us lately and trying to adjust to the new normal of working more from home 
particularly trying to focus on commercial diplomacy where so much of our work is done face to face. And I echo Ambassador Mapuri's comments that I am anxious to return back to that normalcy. Um, maybe diving, diving right in, I think it's, um, it's a great honor to follow Ambassador Mapuri. I echo what has been said several times on this call. Singapore has really stepped up and shown tremendous and exemplary leadership. I know that my office, even at the highest levels, have been in contact with the ambassador's office and with the Singapore government. Um, so we are very, very grateful and we urge other governments around the world to, to look at the example that the Singaporean government has set and the precedence that has been set because it's been helpful for us as a major manufacturer of the personal protective equipment. 3M is the world's largest manufacturer of personal protective equipment. We have manufacturing sites all around the world. And, and to some degree, we were prepared for this pandemic in the early 2000s following the SARS outbreak. We soon realized that we needed to make changes then to ensure we were ready for any pandemic or global outbreak of this scale. So we established what we call surge capacity. What that means is that around the world at about 10 different manufacturing sites, 3M has lines that are dormant, unused equipment that's pushed off to the side that can be very quickly reactivated in the need that we needed to scale up capacity or ramp up very quickly. In late December, we saw the warning signs of us needing to ramp up. So in China, we immediately activated our surge capacity. This was able to help us um, go from about 25 million masks uh, per month to almost double that at around 48 million masks per month in China. In, in less than a two week period, we were able to bring those lines um, into, into, uh, into commission to be able to um, send those out around the world. Within the following two weeks, so by late January, we had increased our surge capacity globally. So we were able to double our output of masks but this still has not been enough. I, I will tell you that the strain on our supply chains is significant. And I, I would like to kind of go through a couple of things that we're seeing right now on the ground globally and offer a bit of input on what is exasperating these challenges. The number one thing that's exasperating these challenges is simply the demand. We are not able to keep pace with the demand around the world. And what's exasperating these demands is a twofold kind of things that different governments are doing and that the general public is doing. Number one, we're seeing improper use of this personal protective equipment. Um, there's differences between surgical masks, industrial masks, and face masks that are available to the general population. And the surgical masks really, really need to be set aside for clinical settings. They need to be available to the healthcare infrastructure. But what we're seeing in a lot of countries is that um, industrial manufacturers are wanting to scoop up these supplies so they can keep their workers at work in their different manufacturing plants. And it's really creating tremendous supply demand and balance for us as we're trying to prioritize the healthcare sector. The number two thing we're seeing that's exasperating this is hoarding. I cannot emphasize enough that around the world, we're seeing a lot of response from governments trying to establish stockpiles. This is not the time to establish a stockpile program. And we need governments to refrain from trying to implement these hoarding practices now. As this outbreak declines, we are happy, more than happy to work with governments on providing them the best guidance for establishing those stockpile programs but trying to establish them now is exasperating the problem. Another tremendous burden on our supply chain has been the increase in trade barriers. As domestic governments feel the political pressure in their countries to implement measures showing that they're taking action, imposing export restrictions is kind of low hanging fruit. We've seen a lot of governments around the world imposing these trade restrictions and it it's quite burdensome for us, and it's causing us to play a bit of whack-a-mole on getting our goods and our products to those who need it most critically. The first country that imposed these very burdensome trade restrictions was China. Um, China did what, what we're calling a mandated allocation. They told us who we could and could not sell to. We were happy to comply and work with the government as they had the data to help us understand where this was needed more, most critically. And we were hoping to help the government isolate this in Wuhan and their other um, hotspots areas. 
But since those that mandated allocation, we've seen a tremendous ripple effect across the entire globe of these restrictions being put in place. Um, most significant for us is the European Union. The European Union has imposed a block-wide export restriction where we are allowed to move goods to some degree within the European Union, but we can't move them outside of the EU 27 plus the UK and the EFTA countries. Hey, Brittany, if I could just ask you, why are they doing this right now? And are these pre-existing regulations or are these new? No, these are new regulations that they're putting in place. They're couching it on a national security decree that gives them the vehicle to be able to do that. And they're doing this now because they want to hoard these uh, personal protective equipment in their countries or in their Got region. It. So, um, you know, for, for example, we've had a tremendous difficulties trying to get products into Italy. The EU's regulation just went into effect about two weeks ago, maybe a little less. Prior to that, um, individual EU countries had imposed restrictions. Germany was the most burdensome for us because we supplied the entire EU out of our facilities in Germany. Um, we had a two week delay on being able to get those products out of that country and just get them into Italy. We've also seen this in other places around the world. Right now, um, Thailand has imposed a very, very strict and tr stringent um, export regulation and we are having a very hard time. We have millions, millions of surgical masks stuck at a dock that we simply can't get out of that country to get to areas that need it critically, like Italy, like the United States, like Spain. So and I would Brittany, encourage- Brittany, how are you? How are you trying to get that unstuck? Are you working with U.S. government officials? Are you working with uh, the diplomatic community here in D.C.? What's the way that you're trying to tackle those challenges? Kind of all of the above. We, we're working with the diplomatic community here in Washington. We're working with the U.S. government. Um, we're working with the diplomatic communities in those countries as well. We're trying to escalate it to the highest levels and, and really encouraging governments to take a multilateral approach. You know, this COVID-19 has no borders. It has no borders. And, and we need to look at it very holistically and understand that restricting the movement of PPE it is burdensome, not, not just for us, but we end up with scenarios where we have millions of masks stuck in a dock. These are millions of masks that could be being put to use right now, but rather they're sitting in warehouses. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that it needs to be looked at very holistically and understand that, you know, being able to contain the outbreak in Italy is to the advantage of the entire world. Being able to contain it in, in Spain or South Korea or here in the United States is to the advantage of the entire world. So we, we really have to look at this holistically. Um, I'll, I'll mention one other area that I think is important to highlight, you know, outside of the supply and demand issues that we're having, we're also facing a lot of issues that other uh, manufacturers are facing. Some of the, the quarantine restrictions, the lockdown restrictions, and the travel bans are making it more difficult for us to get our employees to work. So I would just encourage um, governments globally to take a fact-based approach to that and use common sense measures mm -hmm. to understand that if we can find ways to mitigate without going to worst case scenario of a, of a full quarantine or a lockdown, that we try to keep these, um, these manufacturing lines up and running to the greatest capacity they can. I know the pharmaceutical industry is also facing that same um, issue where it's exasperating their ability to produce critical drugs, not just related to COVID-19, but other drugs elsewhere. So we're, we're kind of doing a little bit of coalition building to help make sure that these common sense measures are, are put in place. And well, well, Brittany, uh, I wanted to thank you so much for sharing uh, your perspective from 3M and for the work that 3M is doing. Um, it sounds to me like uh, there's the supply issue, there's the movement of the goods, the restrictions. Um, and uh, we, we just appreciate everything that you're doing and, and on behalf of Meridian, thank you and look forward to hearing from you in, in the future. Um, I did want to give, thank you. I did want to bring in Nestor Forster, uh, our friend uh, who is uh, Ambassador Forster from Brazil, the Charge d'Affaires of the Embassy of Brazil. Um, Nestor, of course, is in the middle of a very important strategic relationship, a complex relationship between the United States and Brazil, uh, two significant countries with um, a lot of uh, shared economic interests. 
uh, and uh, who are both navigating uncharted uh, territory here. I did want to say that unfortunately, uh, Nestor did test positive for COVID-19 and uh, has been um, uh, basically experiencing this at a very personal level as well as a public and policy level. So Nestor, welcome to Meridian. And I wanted to give you an opportunity perhaps to start off with, how are you? Um, tell, tell us a little bit about your experience and then we'd love to hear about what uh, Brazil uh, is facing and how you are responding and what we can do to help. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you, Meridian, for uh, having me here today. Uh, first of all, beginning with the personal level, let me just tell you that uh, uh, I, I tested positive on uh, March 12th. Uh, I received news that my test came out uh, positive. I had very mild symptoms, uh, flu-like symptoms, fatigue, low fever, congestion, uh, about uh, seven or eight days uh, of those symptoms and then everything was gone. I've been feeling better since then. So th thank you for asking that. On a, on a very positive note also, I'm glad that we, you know, we took all the necessary precautions in our embassy. We have a, a team here, 100, about 120 people working at our embassy, and we did everything we needed to do in terms of the protocols to be followed to avoid any contamination, and uh, we, we were successful in that. We had no other case uh, in our embassy here in D.C. Great. And as far as the uh, Brazil, Brazil's impact, the, the, the impact to the economy, as well as the approach that the government is taking. Obviously, different countries are taking different approaches. I don't know if you heard Ashok Mapuri, our, our friend from Singapore. He has a very different size country, a uh, very different profile. You have a massive country with a massive population, very spread out over a, a broad region. But tell us a little bit about what's going on in, in Brazil. Yeah, uh, good point. Brazil is not a city state. I mean, we all have our different challenges. And uh, what I can tell you is that Brazil has been as serious as Singapore and every other country in tackling this from the outset. We began following what was going on in China on uh, December 31st when it was notified to the uh, World Health Organization that they had this outbreak in Wuhan. Uh, a month before we had the first case in Brazil, on January 22nd, our Ministry of Health established a center for emer emergency operations to tackle uh, uh, the disease. Uh, on uh, January 30th, what we, uh, January 30th, we declared a public calamity related to the virus even before we had the first case, which only came on February 26th. Uh, on March 16th, so just recently, a little over uh, two weeks ago, we had the first community transmission confirmed in Brazil. So this prompted a new phase in the effort to, to fight the disease. And then on the following day, we had the first two deaths associated with the COVID-19 uh, in Brazil. Uh, what have we done uh, so far? Uh, one of the first things we did was to, sh to impose restrictions on the borders with our 10 South American neighbors. It's one of the first things I think Brazil ever did is in history. So this is a symbolic thing also. Uh, a week later, we uh, banned passenger flights coming from uh, 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 countries which had the outbreaks confirmed and, and, and going strong, like China, European Union, Iceland, Norway, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland, Australia, Japan, Malaysia, and South Korea. Let me just point out that we currently have no restrictions on travelers arriving from the United States to this day. Uh, on March 23rd, so just the past Monday, President Bolsonaro launched what he called a crisis cabinet to manage the impact of COVID-19. And he also announced the liberation of some 80 billion reais to, uh, available for the state governors to fight the disease uh, at the local level. As uh, Ambassador Lang pointed out at the outset of this discussion, I mean, uh, we, we need a holistic approach. It's not, you know, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of the Economy, it's everybody together uh, trying to, to address the situation. And that's exactly what we're trying to do in Brazil under the leadership we you know in what re regards the, the health issues uh, of the, our Ministry of Health. So far, the latest statistics, we have about 2,271 cases uh, as of this morning in Brazil. Of those, we have had 48 deaths. There's an interesting concentration. About half of those cases are concentrated in Sao Paulo and Rio in, in uh, uh, 
the, uh, Eastern Brazil. And uh, of those deaths, 40 were in Sao Paulo, six in Rio. And there's one which was uh, the first one in my home state by a 91 uh, year old individual just uh, this morning. Uh, Mester, was... are, are most of the cases of, of deaths in Brazil uh, elderly people or people over the, the age of, of 60 or 70, uh, similar to what you're seeing in, in, in other countries, or is it uh, different? Uh, what we've seen so far, I don't have a breakdown in data that I could point out to you in every specific case, but what we've seen so far confirms the, the, you know, the general data that's out there. Yeah. That's another thing that uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, that has made us some uh, cautious about the prospects of fighting uh, COVID-19 in Brazil. Is if you look, you know, at our health system, we have a universal health co coverage, a public health system that covers the whole of uh, our big country. Uh, and also the profile, the demographic profile of our population uh, gives us some hope that, uh, you know, perhaps the outbreak will not be as severe. We have a smaller population in Brazil compared to other countries that is above uh, the, the, the risk of age of uh, 60 years mm -hmm. old. And that's one thing. Brazil has one of the sm smaller number of smokers anywhere in the world, which is uh, something interesting uh, in, in this context here. And uh, we also, you know, been taking it very seriously in terms of distributing test kits. We have some 10 million made available around the country. There mm -hmm. are measures being taken in terms of, you know, uh, beginning social distancing and uh, teleworking, in, especially in Sao Paulo and Rio, you know, the, and other major cities uh, around Brazil. Esther, thank you very much. Um, we wish you luck and we are obviously uh, looking forward to resuming uh, our, our normal diplomatic and economic uh, activity with Brazil. Uh, there's a lot to do there. It's an important relationship for the United States. And so uh, we look forward to continuing that discussion. So thank you for being here. Uh, I did want to, at this point, share some of the poll uh, results that we've received from the audience. Um, we had a few questions that uh, went out and I just wanted to, I think you all can see that, but just to uh, highlight some of the responses. Uh, the, the consensus on the time frame that we can expect to return uh, the economy uh, to a normal path. Uh, the majority of you, or 50% of you said, said a year, um, and, and uh, five years, of course, was, uh, was the second. On the question about whether the Fed will go into negative interest rates, people were generally unsure, although more of you said yes than no. Um, which country uh, should we follow in terms of uh, an effective response? South Korea was the runaway winner uh, on that question. Um, in terms of uh, future briefings that Meridian can provide, uh, there's a wide uh, interest in continuing to look at the impact of COVID-19 and I think trade and global security uh, come in uh, second there. In terms of a silver lining, if there, if there could be one uh, to this, um, there's, there's a, a feeling that uh, global health security will, will over, receive more, um, uh, more recognition as a major national, national security issue. Some of the things Ambassador Lang uh, was talking about in terms of us not fighting the last war but building uh, the infrastructure we need for the future, that was, that was the most important. And I think that uh, as we've seen um, out of adversity can come sometimes innovation and new approaches to things. Uh, I hope also that people have been able to connect with their families, their loved ones and slow down to the extent that we, we remember what's really important in life. Um, I think everybody's moving a mile a minute in today's world. And this is a, a, an interesting reminder and a time out uh, to focus on what's important. So I wanted to thank John, you for uh, joining us. Uh, you know, we talked about what would happen if it started raining. I'm looking out a window and it is, it is in fact raining here in Washington. I'm sure it's raining in your in your house, uh, your sunroom there in Northern Virginia. Thank you again. I'd like to thank uh, all of the participants and stakeholders uh, for the uh, 
uh, this virtual uh, communication that we had on COVID-19. We will be continuing this series. We have a number of very significant and interesting uh, speakers uh, coming up. I want to remind you that the, the views that you hear expressed by the participants are their views that Meridian is studiously neutral and nonpartisan. And we'd like to thank our corporate council for their support of Meridian. We hope you can lean on us during this uh, time of, uh, of uh, you know, of challenge and uh, that uh, we're, we're all in this together and the more dialogue we can have um, we will be uh, we will be in better shape. So thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again. I'm Stuart Holiday. Have a wonderful week.